Good Tuesday, everyone. Welcome to the VolQuest.com podcast with Austin Price and Rob Lewis. I'm Brent Hubbs. The podcast brought to you by our good friends at Blue Water Climate Control. Remember, you can find check them out at BlueWaterClimateControl.com. And let me tell you right now, they got a special promotion going on uh, that's going to take place starting in the month of January. If you're in the market for a uh, ductless system, uh, they've got some great deals going on with that. A 9,000 BTU for only $1,600, 12,000 BTU for only $1,800. You say, what is that? It's a system that allows you to heat a room. My mom has one in her sunroom in her house. It's fantastic. So if you're looking to um, heat a sunroom or a bonus room, it's a perfect fit uh, with a ductless uh, system that they have. And they've got these uh, on promotion starting in the month of January. They've got special financing on them as well. So give them a call at 865-299-2290 to find out more or check them out online at bluewaterclimatecontrol.com. Guys, tons to get to. Everybody wants to know the black and white. When's it going to, what's going to happen? When's it going to happen? Who's it going to happen to? All these types of things at this point. Um, it changes seemingly our Austin, Rob, depending on who you talk to and what's going on. Um, I, I think the first thing that has to happen uh, before there's anything really moving forward is, is, is where do things go with this investigation uh, that Tennessee's compliance office is looking at? Is it close to being done? Uh, do they find more? Is it on hold until after Christmas? Is it on hold until after uh, some guys come out of COVID, you know, uh, quarantined and that type of thing? Those are the unknowns and you have to find, you have to get those completed before you, I think you move on to any next step. At least that's the, my viewpoint after talking to a bunch of people uh, the last few days. Well, we know they've had conversations with, you know, the coaches on the staff and, and, and then people around you know, the building, um, including some players. So, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, the question is, is like, you know, what, what have they found more so for me than, you know, if they're going to talk to anybody else, I, I, unless they're going to double back for second interviews. I think they've talked to all the major players. It's just about, you know, what have they found? You know, what, you know, what, what comes out of it? You know, are we on, to me, are we on hold post to post Christmas or even post new year? I mean, I mean, how much really work's getting done between this Friday and next Friday? Well, they've certainly talked to a lot of people. There's no doubt about that. And I mean, I think the question is based on the conversations, the question I have, I don't say it's the, it's the question, it's my question based on those conversations that they've had all the way up until the end of last week, do they feel like they need to talk to more people, you know, or did they get the answers that they wanted in those conversations with they've already had to people and, and they, you know, are ready to put a bow tie on it. That's the part. That's the first part of things that you complete that, that I don't know the answer to at this point in time. Uh, and that's the, you know, that's one of the questions I'm trying to get an answer to and, and, and the people that you talk to. Um, so we'll see, is it a big deal? Is it not a big deal? Um, you never know. Uh, it doesn't, you know, you talk to some people, they don't feel like it's a big deal at all. Some other people feel like Rob, it could turn into a big deal. We, we had, you know, we, we, we had a basketball investigation a few years ago that was over some excessive phone calls and it led, ended up in a show calls for, for a basketball coach who's now at Auburn, you know? So what do you uncover in those things? And I'm not saying that's going to happen here. I'm using that as an example. There've been other points in times um, and it's, a, it's a different era at a different time, but, when I was working at the radio station and the, and the phone fraud incident came out, I went and got the documents, 700 pages of documents to go through. Okay. Nobody lost their job over that situation. Not one person. So th there's just a lot of unknown still on what that thing turns into or doesn't turn into, at least yeah. for me. Like you, I've, I've heard both. I've heard some people throw some stuff out there that, you know, they've heard that sounds serious. I've heard some people say that, you know, it's, it's not going to, it's not going to be, you know, anything substantial. But I, I think the main thing for fans and what's frustrating is there's not going to be a resolution, I, I think, like in, in the next day or two. I mean, like Austin said, and I think it could could be after New Year's. And as opposed to, you know, it happening, what you know, what, whatever happens, as opposed to there being a decision and, and an announcement about Jeremy Pruitt's fate, it's not coming, you know, within 48 hours after the season ends. If, if Tennessee had went eight and two this year, and this investigation was going on, the fans would be, oh, this is silly, whatever. But because they went three and seven, they, you know, the, the, this is their reason to get rid of Jeremy. 
Okay. It didn't, it wasn't good enough with, you know, that, that number two continued to trot out there or they went three and seven and lost six in a row. Now this is their justification time to move on. And, 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 you know, the fact that we're here now to Tuesday morning and there's been no decision made on the future outside of the comments that Philip had in the initial bowl release before the bowl was uh, pulled back because of COVID, you know, the, the fans are getting antsy because now they're, it, I think some of the, for some of the fans, it's like, well, if it ain't happened by now, it must not be happening. This is crap. You know, we got to move on. We are killing the program, all that stuff that you see getting thrown out there, whether it be on the general's course or Twitter or else. Um, you know, so I, it, for me, I mean, I think, you know, I just look at this as, an, you know, play the long game, see where this leads and, and, and then go from there. Cause I mean, again, you know, I, I don't see them making any kind of knee-jerk reaction. If they were doing it, to me, they would have done it Saturday night, and it didn't happen. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that. I think for fans, too, the investigation thing is because there's been talk, and, and, and a lot of it's come from me, quite frankly, about, you know, finances are a concern. It's a large, hefty, it's a large, hefty number in a time when you don't, you're not bringing in a lot of revenue. So fans look at this and immediately. The first thing was, does that mean you could fire him for cause and not have to pay the buyout? Right. I mean, that, that's that's the other reason why the investigation is like, oh, they got him. You know, is this a chance to get him and, and you don't have to pay any money? And, and suddenly it makes it really easy to do. You know, um, firing people for calls is really hard. Firing a contract person for calls is really hard. It's not easy. It's got to be completely clear cut, completely well defined. And most of those all end up in court, um, <laughs> you know, so I, I don't. I don't know that that's even a remote possibility. I think you have to lie to the NCAA and get caught. Yeah, there you go. And, and he, pro I think he's still got some money to leave. I, th I think Bruce still got some money. He got, a, he got a million dollars. Yeah, I mean, which the, I don't, I didn't think they needed to pay him anything. No, you know, I guess Donnie Tindall got nothing, right? No. So Zero. that that's that's the last one. That's the one that had was fired truly for cause and and didn't get any money there. So it's doable. It's just. Um, it, it's, it's got to be, be egregious. It's got to be pretty egregious. It, it absolutely yeah. does. Yeah, and the money thing, I mean, like the, to me, the money thing, Brent, you look at it two different ways. Like, you know, you can say, you know, you got to spend money to make money, uh, or in this instance, lose money to make money. Um, because I mean, like, you know, you, let's just throw out numbers. Like, let's say if you sell 7,000 less tickets a, a game on season ticket sales next year, that's 3.2 million in lost revenue, you know, and, and then you start at factoring in like, how much did those 7,000 tickets, how much would they have spent at the concession stand and, 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 and all of that? How much were they going to donate to buy those tickets? Yeah. I mean, so like, you know, that, that 13 million or, or let's say it's whatever, it was 18 million for the whole staff or whatever, all that can, you, you kind of make up the ground pretty quick. Um, but again, though, to, to do it, you know, you know, the way most people do it, which is, you know, private donations, you know, is anybody willing to pony up the dough, you know, right now? Because then you become Auburn. But that's the, of, right. That's your concern if you get into that. a bunch that. of rich people in the room feeling like they have as much voice as the, the chancellor or the president. Or the well, I mean, but but you, you get a fan base because of the Shiano thing feels like they have as much voice as anybody. I mean, they, yeah, you, but, you, you, you see yeah, them start to put out on Twitter, we're going to have a we're gonna have a rally at the Rock. You know, and, 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 and so, like, the fans feel like, you know, they have as big a voice as anybody else because no, of the Giano incident. But no offense to the fans, they don't, okay? They, 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 they and, I, and I don't want to discredit the fans, but the guy giving seven-figure donation and the guy writing the seven-figure check to make somebody goes away has more of a voice than someone who's making a donation for two season tickets who goes to the Rock to rally, okay? I, and, I agree. And, I, and, I, and I'm not trying to – I'm not trying to – I'm not trying to belittle any fan in any way, shape, or form, but there was a whole lot going on on that Sunday more than a rally at the Rock as to why Greg Schiano ended up. I'm not saying that that didn't have a factor, but I'm just saying there was a lot of other pieces involved in that equation um, that went beyond, you know, uh, you know, angry fans who were who were you know rallying against that on Twitter or in person on campus. Um, were you surprised that, at, at Coach Fulmer's comment? in the uh in the release about the springboard for for jeremy pruitt into spring practice with bowl practice obviously it's not going to happen and it was 
really miss uh, really inaccurate because they were going to have such few practices anyway. But were you surprised he threw that in at the bottom of the quote uh, as kind of a plant your flag a little bit for Jeremy Pruitt? No, because I think that Coach Fulmer has always felt that way. You know, he he's never come out and went, you know, head first into the to the, to the deep end with it. But you know, I mean, we we've all known that you know Coach Fulmer is behind Coach Pruitt, even I think if he's been frustrated about some things, you know, I think he, you know, as, as an old head coach who, you know, feels like he was unjustly let go too soon in 2008, um, you know, probably has felt like, you know, hey, did, this guy deserves a fourth year. You know, I mean, think about it. Year one, he's left with nothing under Butch. Year two, um, you know, they go eight and five. Now, granted, they had two bad losses to BYU and to Georgia State. Um, and then year three is a pandemic year. So, I mean, like, you know, I, I think that in his mind, you know, it was, it, this place was in disarray when, when, when Jeremy got here. Now, don't get me wrong. Some of Butch's players have been some of the best players Jeremy's had during his three years here. But when you look at the totality of who's gotten drafted and everything else, I think Coach Fulmer sees that as there wasn't a whole lot here. And so this guy probably deserves another year, even if the fans feel like he doesn't. Rob, I think we've all known and we've reported that, that that's been Coach, Coach Fulmer's belief and, and thought process. Were you, were you surprised that he publicly stated that, um, <clears throat> I, I guess, as strong as he did? I guess I was a little bit just because he has seemed reluctant to do that very thing when given many opportunities and when the need, you know, if that's what you're going to do, when the need – the justification for it was was there has been there for weeks so for him you know for him to do it when all the you know the criticism the the fan outrage is was at a crescendo for him to choose that moment to do it I, yeah i was a little bit surprised and also i mean and i don't i don't know this but don't you think there's also some self-preservation there that you know how likely is it that he's going to be the athletic director that makes you know the, the, the next hire at his age, since Jeremy was his guy. I mean, any coach out there is going to, I would think, is going to probably rightfully wonder, you know, how long is this guy going to be my AD? Am I going to have a new boss in two or three years? You know, he, he you know, obviously, you know, made the hire last time around. He, he you know, some, some, you know, some money people. But, Brent, don't you feel like that, like, he was left with, like, you know, crumbs on a plate. Oh yeah. To make the hire. I mean, like, I, 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 look, I'm not defending Phillips' decisions or or blasting Phillips. I'm just saying, like, when you just kind of look at it from the outside looking in, like, like he he took over a a total fiasco and was asked for a miracle. And I mean, like, his three finalists were Kevin Steele, a guy that I think Auburn would like to hire, but you know, their fans have been screaming bloody murder about Kevin. Um, and, you know, Mel Tucker, who went to Colorado for, you know, a quick five minutes and then now is at Michigan State and then now Jeremy Pruitt. So, I mean, it's not like he was, you know, you know, interviewing Urban Meyer and 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 and, and a bunch of guys that have got some pedigree to them. No, I don't I, I don't disagree with that at all. Um, I, I mean, you know, I, I think that he did the best he could in a in a short period of run. Did he make the right decision? Well, I mean you know, this year, it certainly hasn't worked out at the end of last year. The conversation was everybody was worried about, you know, Jeremy going to Alabama when Nick Saban retired. Right. That's uh, right. I mean, that's how quickly it changes. It does. And and look, that's, I'm not sitting here to make a joke. Look, Jeremy Pruitt's put himself in this situation because this football team did not perform very well this year. They didn't get better. They don't have an identity in three years. He's had a hard time getting his staff. Right. Okay. You know, never and, found a quarterback. and this, that, and the other, all these things, that, uh, you know, stack upon you and, and the old Bill Parcells line, you are who you are. You are what your record is and his record, not very good. Um, but no, I mean, I think you're right. Um, but again, I, I think it's with that, with the point you're making, Austin, that makes it even a little bit more surprising that he seemed to plant his flag a little bit more as, as opposed to the self-preservation of, kind of taking care of himself you know it, does that make sense that he didn't I don't want to say distance himself but you know he, he he didn't leave as much wiggle room with that quote in my you know when he did the vol calls thing it was you know 
to ask him for some patience and he compared him to coach major's record, but he never said anything about the future with, with, with Jeremy Pruitt. This was his first comment and a release about Jeremy Pruitt and the future when the fan base right now is as, as hot as they've ever been. Uh, I mean, Jeremy Pruitt. I, I, I always took the Johnny majors comment as a future type comment. Cause you're trying to say, look what coach majors became. Yeah. And, and the record. And, and so I, I, I'm not sure coach, coach Fulmer's never been a, uh, uh, a guy that wins the press conference or the sound bite machine. He's not one that, you know, uh, I, even when he wants to try to articulate it a certain way is not the best. Um, and that doesn't, you know, that's not a knock on him. A football coach who, you know, doesn't deal with the media a ton and, you know, doesn't really want, want to, to be honest with you. So, I mean, like when he does, I don't think he's an eloquent speaker. Um, sometimes he's just a little rough around the edges. So, um, you know, I, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, he, he, he's had his back and, you know, even when it didn't seem like he was trying to back him, I felt like he said probably was trying to back him. He just didn't know how to say it. So he's he's made that statement, but you haven't had any statements from anywhere else in terms That's of right. the leadership at, at Tennessee. So the question is, what where is Randy Boyd in this? Where is the chancellor in this? Um, and kind of what does that look like moving forward? Are they leaving everything up to Philip Fulmer, or is it more of a situation where they're going to be more hands on? Um, I, I think we all we all probably feel like for this thing to for Jeremy Pruitt to be moving forward. At some point, the chancellor's got to come out and say he's the football coach, right? I mean, I, I think that I think at this point that's probably required to to put anything to bed, and and we'll see if that if that happens or if they go in a different direction. This thing changes seemingly um, in some way, not not a great deal. It hadn't changed a great deal the last forty eight hour, twenty four hours, but I thought, you know. I thought there seemed like there was blood in the water Saturday. Just with phone calls, I was having conversations, I was having. It's gotten a lot. It was a lot quieter today, at least for people that yeah. I talked to. Yeah, I would. I would think that. I mean, Saturday it was like you know the the vibe from a lot of people after the game was like it's done, it's coming fast, you know. And it's and then Sunday it didn't feel that way, and certainly it's not felt that way um, on Monday, um, or it didn't feel that way on Monday as, as we head into Tuesday. So obviously that's the most prominent topic and what everybody's talking about. We're going to continue to chase it and find out everything we can find out and try to make, uh, try to figure out what rumors are true and what rumors are not true and, and all those types of things as we move forward. I just want, before we change the conversation, I just want to ask one thing. And AP, I saw you mention it in, in the chat. If, I mean, if it does come to the point where you're going to have to replace three to five assistant coaches, do you not look at it and, and say, you know, what's the point? Yeah, I mean, to me, that's the, that's the, the to me, that's the biggest question of them all. The, outside of you know, is Jeremy Pruitt going to be back? Is if if he's going to be back, how many assistant coaches do you allow him to replace before you just go? You know, uh, if we're going to blow up the whole staff, then let's just blow up the whole staff. You know, I, again, I think that that potentially could mean that guys like Chris Winky, like let's say Wilfren does go to South Carolina, does that help a guy like Chris Winky who's got a one year? Uh, you know, one year left on that deal to potentially be back as quarterbacks coach. You know, I, I think it possibly could. I mean, I, I really do. I think that, you know, the the more guys that defect could alter the guys that he may actually want to move on from. Wait, does does John Palermo move to the edge of his scene? <laughs> well uh, or, or 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 is what somebody called him in the in the chat taco canal <laughs> Why can I, he's available unfortunately he lost his job earlier this week um was was removed uh Get go baby from from where he was at so no, yeah. there's not a, no, I, i'll say this the, the, all jokes said there's not a nicer guy that has come through this program than that man i would agree with that yeah i mean I, nice super yeah. nice guy. yeah fan, fantastic guy so lots of questions and, and again I, I i've said this i think if you're you're trying if you're a decision maker trying to decide on, on what you're going to do for the future i think you have to set and examine multiple things one thing you have to examine is why this season happened the way it did what is the response you know what is how much of it was COVID? how much of it is just quarterback why did this team not uh develop 
more than it did. Uh, secondly, you got to decide, do I believe that Jeremy Pruitt can lead this program to a competitive situation where they're competing for a division championship, where they can get to, get to the point where they're competing in the Eastern division? And then if the answer to that is, yeah, I think he can, then my question when I sit down with Jeremy Pruitt would be, tell me how you get there. And, and don't tell me we're going to go out and hire the best guys in, the, in there. We're going to go out and recruit the best guys. I need some specifics on how you're going to get there. You're going to have to have a detailed plan for me to map out how, how you're going to get it moving to that direction and that's the way you want to go. If I were, if I were a, a power person who's making a decision, that's kind of how I would map it out and, and start with it, you know, in, in terms of making a decision moving forward. And, and look, that, doing that, you're examining beyond wins and losses, okay? Leadership off the field, um, management of things off the field, not just what you look like on game day um, and those types of things. So no, like, here, here's a question for you, Hubs. Like the whole notion, and just put in a chat, and I get it, is, is, is you go back to the Dooley 2012 year where they were pulling, as, John, or as Rob said earlier, you know, John Palermo out of the lake house. But if you could get a quality guy, and I'm not saying they're going to hire this guy, I'm just saying like this kind of coach. If you can get guys like Eddie Graham, who's an older coach, who's experienced, who's available. And I'm, again, I'm not saying they're getting him. I'm just using him as the example. Do you think that that's a better version of what Dooley was able to do in 2012 to where you could finally, you might be able to find some guys like that out there to add to your staff to where it's not a bunch of guys that are just retreads that are not very good. I do think, I mean, I, I don't mean that this will be automatic, but I do think the places Jeremy has been the kind of guy he is. I, I, I would dare say he has some better relationships in the coaching fraternity than Derek Dooley did at the time when he was, you know, desperately trying to put together a staff. I mean, there might be some guys who would do this for Jeremy for personal reasons, when even when it looks like it could be a tenuous situation professionally. Well, Austin, I think you ask a great question. And, and, and Rob, I don't disagree with your point. I think he's been around a lot of proven winners. You know, a lot of people have come through the programs he's been at, and, and he should have some relationships there. I think you had to ask a great question, Austin. And I think that when I say this is the answer I have to have, I have to have what the answer is in those positions. If you're going to hire almost like when Shane Beamer went into South Carolina and said, Hey, I want to bring Jake Graham to South Carolina. You know, when he went in for his interview, you're almost, you're almost re-interviewing, so to speak mm -hmm. with, with, with your direction for the program, even yeah. though you're the head coach. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you, I mean, you got to know, I got to know if I'm just making the decision on his fate, I got to know what this thing looks like because because you've seen it when a guy didn't really have a plan and he threw a staff together as Derek Dooley did on defense. And we all saw what happened with that. Right. So I, I don't think there's any doubt that you have to have a clear defined plan um, from Jeremy Pruitt. If he's the head coach back at, at Tennessee moving forward. And again, we'll wait and see what happens in the coming days. Um, I don't think it's something in the coming hours, but I've learned a long time ago around here, you just absolutely that you never know, you know, what might or might not happen. All right, let's, uh, let's change the, the subject for a minute and talk about something that's rolling right now. Let's talk about this Tennessee basketball team, Rob. Man, that's like going, that's like going from Charlize Theron and Monster <laughs> to like 23 year old Charlize Theron. <laughs> so th this, this basketball team has got weapons. They're scoring in a lot of different ways. They seem to have great chemistry right now. As somebody told me, on Monday night, I, I, I'm, I'm trying not to get too excited because it's Tennessee and I'm waiting for something, you know, bad to happen along the way. But, I mean, lots of good vibes there, Rob Lewis. Lots of good vibes. Yeah, I mean, fun to watch. As you just mentioned, great chemistry, tremendous athletic ability. I mean, somebody was asking in the chat tonight, is this the most, most athletic Tennessee team ever? I, I mean, it's the most athletic one I've seen. I wasn't around, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis for, you know, Jerry Green's last couple of go rounds with you know Vincent Yarbrough, Marcus Hayslip, Isaiah Victor, but I don't I don't think they had guys like you know Hayslip was pretty freaky, but I don't I don't know like Keon Johnson, you know, Eve Pons. I mean with Victor Bailey and Jaden Springer might be the third or fourth just best pure athletes on your team, you've you've got some dudes. 
Yeah, you know, here's the thing about them. You know, everybody talks about the athletic ability, and they have terrific athletes. But they're athletes who know how to play the game. They're not an athlete that you look at and you go, wow, he's a great athlete. You, you know what I'm saying? I mean, some guys you look at, I mean, for example, Eve Pons, his freshman year, you would say, you know what? He's a really good athlete. What a great athlete. But that was kind of the qualifier saying, not a very polished basketball player. You know what I'm saying? This group is a bunch of really good athletes who really know how to play the game of basketball. They got a lot of basketball IQ and savvy to them. I mean, Ke- Keon is the best athlete slash guy who knows how to play basketball and has a feel for the game that I've seen come through here. You know, Springer's ahead of him offensively right now. I mean, he's more polished. He has, a, you know, more maturity to his game. But, I mean, Keon is just an absolute freak. I mean, he'll play in the NBA for 12 years and be a good player on good teams, I would bet. And it's just – it's like I wrote tonight. They can they can just come at you in waves. I mean, not that – I mean, Tennessee was going to beat St. Joe's anyway, but you got to see that depth tonight. I mean, Josiah got in foul trouble. Jaden was in foul trouble. And it didn't matter. I mean, Tennessee just brings it up. That's just more minutes for Keon, more minutes for, for Bailey. And, you know, when you saw the fouls on a team that's not as talented or deep like St. Joe's, you saw the fouls start piling up on them. And it goes from being a 20-point game to a 40-point game in a, in a hurry in the second half. And, you know, that depth, the ability that they have with that depth, I mean, there's a lot to like about this team. But I, I, the, those, five, the, those five guys on the perimeter – are as good as anybody in the country when you're talking about Viscovi, Viscovi James, Bailey, Jaden, and Keon. I don't think any other team in the country has five dudes at the guard spots. Like the that. fact the fact they can be so aggressive on defense because of that depth just to me it makes their their ability to defend even greater. Oh yeah. And, and they, they can all play like their hair's on fire and yeah. get tired and come out. And the, and the guy coming in is just as good as the, as the guys replace, which is a, an incredible luxury. All right. So here's the, here's my million dollar question about this team, Rob. And, and I've, I've, I've asked Rick Barnes this a couple of times and he, I, I wouldn't say that I've gotten a great answer out of him from it. Why does this team who hasn't been, it's not been a normal off season for them, you know, and everything else. Why, why does this team have the chemistry that they have? Because it's not all – and look, I know Bailey was here, okay, a year ago, so he practiced with them, so he, he knows this team. But you throw in two guys who are potential NBA lottery picks right out of the gate. And they, starting. And, yeah, and they seem to blend in really well. Then you bring in Anasiki, right? He seems to blend in really well. Vascovi spent more time away from the team than with the team this offseason because of COVID. Yet, chemistry-wise, they seem to be as in sync as you'll see a team. They're like in mid-season form on the court, and then off the court, it's clear that they get along. Why is the chemistry on this team so good? I, tell you, I mean, I don't know if I'm going to have the perfect answer, but I'll tell you, I think one of the biggest things is it starts in recruiting. I mean, he's just – he's not recruiting any a-holes. He's, he's done. I don't care if it's – the kid is – as talented as, as Zion Williamson, if he's a me first, selfish guy with an attitude, Tennessee's not not even starting the conversation. I mean, they identify these kids early. The assistants do a great job. You know, Kim Kim's not been here that long, but Mike and Des have been here long enough. And Mike played for Rick as a, that they they know what kind of kid it's going to take to play for Rick. And I to me, that's where it starts. They're not bringing guys into this program who aren't going to be a fit for the culture. I mean, Rick's, you know, past the point in his career where he's chasing wins with, with kids that he doesn't enjoy coaching. And he, he won't do that. And so that, that's where it starts. And I think that they get here, they see the older guys, you know, Fulky and Pons are not the most vocal dudes in the world, but they see how they work. They see how Rick treats them like, like they're water boys in practice. You know, and they, they know what's expected. I mean, they're like, you know, John Fulkers is an all SEC player. If he's taking that from coach, you know, what am I, you know, what, how, what have I got to, to say about, you know, what, what he's saying to me? So, I mean, I think that's part of it. And I think also, I mean, Rick is not this way off the court, like, you know, in the locker room or when they're watching film, but in practice, I mean, he's like the drill sergeant, full metal jacket. I mean, he's, he is bananas and they all, get it and I think that kind of I, I think that creates a bond I mean it's not Kevin O'Neill don't get me wrong he's not 
person, you know, personally ripping guys for anything other than basketball. But he's not, you know, trying to get inside their head and, and demean them. I mean, it's all about basketball. It's all about, you know, skills about getting better. But I think having to endure how hard and intense he is in practice, I, I think that forges a bond too. Kind of like hazing. <laughs> <laughs> interesting I, I tell you what it's just I mean I, I knew it would be I mean I, I thought their chemistry would be fine I didn't think it would be like this you know out of the gate the way it is all right conference season's coming quickly w- what is it about this w- what is it about this team that you like most going into conference play what's your biggest concern with this team moving into conference play well, de- defense and depth without doubt start there uh, I mean I think the, the potential is there to be a really good offensive team but we all know you know, some nights, you know, maybe you're on the road in Baton Rouge and you can't make a shot. But defense is always going to be there. And I think this team, I'll be stunned if they're not the best defense team in the SEC when you're talking about opponent field goal percentage, things of that nature. Um, rebounding. I mean, I think they've been good. Anna Sicky certainly brings something there. To, I thought against St. Joe's, it was perfect. He played 14 minutes. He took – what, two or three shots? I can't remember. But they were all just either off an offensive rebound or just bang, you know, right at, right at the rim. And um, he's given them exactly what they need from him. But Folky and Eve have got to hold their, hold their own down there. And uh, Josiah is going to do like what he did the other night. He grabbed eight boards. And Keon and Jaden are both strong enough and big enough to where they can be above average rebounders for their position. But rebounding and, and handling really elite size are, are the only things that concern me about this team. Tennessee opens SEC play Missouri. We'll talk much more about that uh, coming up uh, next week as, as Tennessee gets ready for, for SEC play. But this volunteer basketball team, fun to watch, uh, have hit the ground running and uh, have certainly uh, manhandled the last couple of teams that they have played and has created plenty of excitement. Obviously, on the football side of things, there's lots of questions and uh, lots of rumors that we're sorting through and lots of topics to discuss. We'll continue to do that on the general's quarters and continue to chase everything down that we can. That's going to do it for this edition of the Blue Water Climate Control VolQuest.com podcast. For Austin Price and Rob Lewis, I'm Brent Hubs. Thanks for listening. Have a great rest of your Tuesday, everybody.